Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Rule Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and the patrons on Patreon voted for Virginia to be covered in the next statehood video. If you'd like to vote on the next state to be covered or which battle I will animate next, please go to the Patreon page and join for as little as $1 and you can cast your ballot. When the Constitutional Convention ended in September 1787, Virginia's delegates made a great impact on the construction of the governing document. James Madison's contribution and his notes got him the nickname of Father of the Constitution. Although proud of their own states, delegates from other states looked to Virginia as a model and a leader in the convention and when each state debated ratification. Virginia was the largest state in terms of physical size as well as population, which also played a role in its debate over ratification of the Constitution. The 168 delegates met in Richmond, Virginia on June 2, 1788 to debate whether they would adopt the Constitution or not. The convention elected Edmund Pendleton, a strong Federalist, as the president to preside over the debate. One aspect that the Anti-Federalists focused on was the fact that Virginia, with its great size and population, could survive on its own and did not need the other states. It could exist as its own nation. Two Federalist powerhouses in the country, and specifically Virginia, was James Madison and George Washington. Although Washington would not attend the ratification convention, Madison would, and he laid out the case for the Federalists. One of the biggest arguments the Federalists laid out was that this vote went beyond politics or economics. It was a vote for union or disunion. That argument itself influenced many men who stood with the Anti-Federalists. The Virginia Gazette, before the convention, explained the situation well when they said, The great political question now is, observes a Federalist, whether America shall or shall not have a government that will make of thirteen states a united people, happy amongst themselves and respected by other nations. To effect the former, the adoption of the federal government is the only alternative. An anti-federal says, the great political question now is whether the states of America, united by their solemn faith and common interests, shall continue to be a federal republic, so constructed in its forms, and vested with such complete and extensive general powers as will embrace every federal object and render the general government great, energetic, and respectable, and preserve to the states their independence in the full and free exercise of their internal sovereignty, and consequently the people free, intelligent, prosperous, and happy, or whether they shall adopt a consolidated government of such a nature and so extensive as never did nor never can in the nature of things preserve confidence in government or happiness and political freedom to the people. Madison saw three sides, Federalists, those who supported the Constitution with amendments, and Anti-Federalists. The trick would be to keep those who favored the Constitution with amendments from going to the side of the Anti-Federalists. Almost immediately when the debates began, Patrick Henry, leader of the Anti-Federalists, began one of his many diatribes against the Constitution. He would state, I look on that paper as the most fatal plan that could possibly be conceived to enslave a free people. If such be your rage for novelty, take it and welcome, but you never shall have my consent. One of his chief complaints was with the president. He believed the Constitution vested him with too much power that all the president would have to do is to take one extra step to become a king. By this point, the Revolutionary War was less than five years old. Henry would state, Away with your president. We shall have a king, he thundered. The army will salute him monarch. Your militia will leave you and assist in making him king and fight against you. And what have you to oppose this force? What will then become of you and your rights? Will not absolute despotism ensue? He and the Anti-Federalists feared that the Constitution gave too much power to representatives and the President. He argued that you could not trust people to govern, and that ultimately demonstrates the two ideas present on the debate floor. The Federalists did not wholly trust people to govern, but they believed a well-crafted government could cut down on tyranny. Anti-Federalists claimed that the best government to prevent tyranny was one with less power, that a government, no matter how well crafted, could not have a system of checks and balances strong enough to prevent tyranny. The biggest problems that Henry saw were taxation and congressional power over the army. He stated, Congress, by the power of taxation, by that of raising an army, 
and by their control over the militia, have the sword in one hand and the purse in the other. They went hand in hand. Congress could create armies, equip them, and pay them. Anti-Federalists asked if the army would be the pawn of Congress. Plus, if Congress linked up with the President, what would stop them from enforcing laws detrimental to Americans? 18th century Americans feared a standing army because of their experiences with a standing army were horrific. Anti-Federalists viewed the national government as a single entity, not three separate branches, so they proposed a separation of the purse and the sword by giving Congress the power of the purse and the state the power of the sword. This they viewed as the only safeguard to liberty. Federalists fought back insisting that the national government would be so diverse in their branches and within their branches that a concentrated effort to use both the purse and the sword would be extremely difficult to the detriment of the country. Anti-Federalists suggest increasing the size of Congress to make the likelihood of consent for tyrannical ideas more difficult to get past. One of the chief concerns and one that permeated all ratification discussions was the lack of a Bill of Rights. Federalists assured the convention that since the Constitution did not outright give the federal government a power, they could not use such a power. Anti-Federalists argued that a citizen's rights needed declared in a Bill of Rights to safeguard against any encroachment of the federal government on those rights. One of the most iconic moments of the convention was when Edmund Randolph got up to speak. The governor of Virginia, an influential public figure, was ambiguous in the lead up to the convention. Which way would he vote? Randolph, early in the convention, stood up and delivered a speech. The following is part of what he said. As with me, the only question has ever been between previous and subsequent amendments, so I will express my apprehensions that the postponement of this convention to so late a day has extinguished the probability of the former without inevitable ruin to the Union, and the Union is the anchor of our political salvation, and I will assent to the lopping of this limb, meaning his arm, before I assent to the dissolution of the Union. Clearly, he did not fully support the Constitution, but he saw a vote against the Constitution as a vote against the United States. He, above all, wanted to see the states come together, and he saw no other way than through the Constitution. His influence and speech would help sway anti-federalists to vote for ratification. Robert W. Smith's article, Foreign Affairs and the Ratification of the Constitution in Virginia, explains the anti-federalist stance revolved around Virginia's ability to exist without the aid of other states or a central government. Smith explains that George Mason laid out the defense for the anti-federalists during the Constitutional Convention in 1787, and that he feared that an extensive commercial power granted to Congress would harm the interest of the southern states. On August 29, 1787, Mason supported a motion to require a two-thirds majority for a Navigation Act because the North would have a majority in both houses of Congress. Otherwise, the southern states will deliver themselves bound hand and foot to the eastern states. These fears carried over to Virginia's ratification convention. The Anti-Federalists wanted Virginia to conduct its own economic destiny and not be tied down by other states' policies or be directed by the federal government concerning who Virginia could do business with internationally. One has to remember that the modern state of Kentucky was part of Virginia at this time, and that means Virginia was bordered by the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. The other southern states extended their claims all the way to the Mississippi as well, and relied on that river to promote settlement of their far western reaches. When no agreement could be made with Spain to relinquish its hold of the lower Mississippi, Kentuckians became distrustful of the government in Richmond and the central government. For at least two days during the ratification convention, the entire day revolved around discussions of the Mississippi River. Western Virginians feared that a strong federal government filled with northern congressmen would take little interest in opening up the Mississippi River for trade to help the economy of Western Virginia, and may even vote down bills or treaties that would promote the growth of the region. The delegates of what is now Kentucky numbered 14 and could easily sway the convention to one side or the other. They were the ones who led the discussion about the Mississippi River. They argued that to keep population centers in the east and thus political power, northern and eastern states would hinder the economic opportunities of the western regions and or states. Kentuckians argued that Congress had no incentive to help or protect potential future states like Kentucky hoped to be. Another heated debate was over slavery. 
Weirdly, the Anti-Federalists criticized the allowance of the African slave trade to continue for another 20 years, and they also criticized the omission of a clause protecting slave property. They were arguing that the Constitution hurt and supported slavery all at the same time. Mason, an Anti-Federalist, stated that bringing in more slaves would weaken the state. One reason for that statement was that only three-fifths of the slave population counted toward representation. Therefore, a white population would add more political power to the state. Madison stepped in and informed Mason and Patrick Henry that they had to include the 20-year extension of the slave trade because South Carolina and Georgia would not agree to the Constitution without it. At the end of debate, George Wythe called for a vote. Ratification passed 89-79 to on June 25, 1788, and Virginia became the 10th state to join the Union.